Hello there. Welcome back to Jenny Designs with Paper and this week's episode of Crime and Coloring, where we take an alphabetical journey through the United States and revisit some of the earliest crimes. But before we talk crime, let's talk coloring. I am using this color palette today. I think it is gorgeous. The kind of corally reds with the dark bluish greens, a little bit of warm grays in there. Gorgeous. I'm going to be creating a one layer or a yeah, one layer scene card. So I have a piece of white cardstock. I have a brick wall background stencil. I have a My Favorite Things stamp set that I will be using. Also some masks. I have the Ink Blot Shop ground stamp set. I will be using my Misty. I have some light gray ink and a blending brush. I'm stamping all the images in my Simon Says Stamp Intense Black Ink so I can Copic color this. I'm also using the sticky mat for my Misty because I need to put the cardstock not down in the corner because those um, ground stamps are longer than my card is and I wanted to kind of center it because it does show a little bit of perspective. I am doing a one layer card like I said before so I need to put the stamps, I need to stamp the stamps in order from the front of the image to the back. So I will start with the girl. I will then add the windows to the shop wall, the sidewalk she's walking down, and then the items in the windows and the brick wall. I should have added the items in the window first um, because that would have there was a little bit of masking I, masking I needed to kind of cover over. Also, I realized that I've had this stamp set forever and the Things I'm using for windows are actually like display stands, not windows. So yeah, I need to <laughs> need to figure something else about out about that. Um, I have used this stamp set before, so the masks have been inked up and are already used, but that's wonderful. I can use them again. And I am using ink to put the brick wall onto the um, card front, but then I will use some Copic markers to add some dimension. I think that's all of the coloring. So let's hop on into our crime. Our journey today takes us to Washington, D.C. While Washington, D.C. is not a state, it is definitely integral to the United States, so we can't skip it. Washington, D.C. was founded on July 16, 1790, and was completely and intentionally planned to become the national capital, and it needed to be distinct from the states. President George Washington chose the specific site along the Potomac and Anacostia Rivers. Congress, after a lot of discussion, located the federal city on the Potomac River by act of Congress, which was then approved by President Washington. The first map of Washington was authorized by an act of, act of Congress, and the map was drawn by Peter Charles L'Enfant. Um, Peter, after he did a lot of research, he requested maps um, of cities like London, Madrid, Paris, Amsterdam, Naples, Venice, and Florence. He studied the cities and how they were laid out. And then he laid out Washington, D.C. He planned the streets, the parks. He planned the site for the future president's home and the Capitol building. And all of these buildings and streets and parks, parks are essentially where he drew them. It was agreed that the federal district should be called the Territory of Columbia after Christopher Columbus and the federal city, the city of Washington, after George Washington. It was also agreed that the streets would be named alphabetically north to south and numerically east to west. Our nation's capital is known for things other than crazy politics and weird politicians. Washington, D.C. is only 68 square miles in area. And with all the attention to the layout of the streets, it was decided there would be no J Street. The letter J at that time of the creation of the capital looked a lot like the letter I. And in order to prevent confusion, they would just not have a J Street. 
I'm not sure why they chose to drop the J and not the I, but they did. Interestingly enough, Seattle gets less rain per year than Washington, D.C. does. I'm guessing that that's because they get a little bit every day and Washington gets theirs all at once. <laughs> in 1994, sorry, in 1999, four of the famous cherry trees in Wash on the Washington Mall were vandalized. They were chopped down by beavers. The National Cathedral has gargoyles on its towers, and the Northwest Tower gargoyle is a sculpted head of Darth Vader. There is a copy of the Constitution, a map of the city, a book of poems, a Bible, and daryotypes of George Washington and his mother buried under the Washington Monument, but George is actually buried at his home at Mount Vernon. Washington, D.C. used to be covered by the ocean, and you can still find fossils around the area. In fact, we go to Fossil Beach, beach occasionally. Woodrow Wilson is the only president to be buried at the National Cathedral. The Supreme Court building is reportedly haunted by a ghost cat that leaves paw prints outside the chamber. The first president to call the president's house or president palace the White House was Andrew Jackson, and the name was officially changed by Theodore Roosevelt in 1901. And it seems that politics in Washington, D.C. have always made strange bedfellows. Washington, D.C. was the place that temporary insanity was first used as a mitigating factor in a criminal trial. Now, to start our story today, we're going to talk about Teresa de Point Bagioli. Teresa was born in New York in 1836 and was the daughter of the wealthy and well-known Italian singing teacher Antonio Bagioli and his wife Maria Cook. Maria was the adopted and probably or supposed biological child of Lorenzo de Point. Lorenzo was a noted music teacher who worked as Mozart's librarist, which is the text author, on masterpieces like The Marriage of Figaro. During her youth, Teresa sometimes lived and studied at her grandfather Lorenzo's home. She was reportedly an exceptionally bright child, and she spoke five languages by the time she was a young adult. Teresa had an uncle who was a New York University professor. This uncle befriended a young man named Daniel. This friendship helped Daniel secure a scholarship to the university, and Daniel moved into the DuPont home to study. He only lived there about a year, however, because his mentor suddenly died. But he did maintain close ties with the family and continued his studies of Italian and French. Let's talk about Daniel. Daniel Edgar Sickles was born October 20th in 1819 in New York City to Susan and George Sickles. George was a patent lawyer and a politician. Daniel learned how to be a printer and he, when he studied at the University of New York and then while he was living at the DuPont home. And then he studied law at the office of Benjamin Butler. He was then admitted to the bar in 1843, and then in 1847, he was elected as a member of the New York State Assembly. And because Daniel had lived at Lorenzo's home, he knew Teresa as a small child, like from her infancy, really. But in 1851, they were reacquainted. By this time, Daniel was an assemblyman. He was 32. She was 15. Now, by the time Daniel had been reacquainted with Teresa, he had already gained quite a reputation, and not the good kind. He was known to be a notorious womanizer. However, he was quite taken with young Teresa and soon proposed marriage. Despite his political prominence and his long connection to the family, um, Teresa's parents refused to consent to the marriage. Yeah, think he's twice her age, but ooh, okay, never mind. 
<sighs> he's old and she's not. She's not old enough for that to not be weird because she's 15. Anyway, young love is often undeterred and the couple were married on September 17th, 1852 in a civil ceremony. Um, the family relented and the couple were married again, this time with John Hughes, the Catholic Archbishop of New York presiding. Then in 1853, their only child, a daughter named Laura was born. Now, one thing to note is that Daniel's year of birth is sometimes listed at 1825, and Daniel has been known to claim he was born in 1825. However, the speculation of historians is that um, he wanted to appear younger when he married a woman that was half his age. He didn't want to look like a creepy old man. Okay, sorry. <laughs> You know, if she was 19 or 20, it would not bug me so much. But she was 15. Ooh, 15. <sighs> okay, I'm done. I'm done. Probably not, but I'll stop for now. <laughs> the rest of the story cannot be told without the introduction of Philip Barton Key II. Philip was born on April 5th, 1818, in the Georgetown area of Washington, D.C. He was the son of Francis Scott Key, the author of The Star-Spangled Banner, and his wife, Mary Lloyd. Philip was obviously educated, and even though his family has is prominent and his death was infamous, there wasn't a, a lot written down about his early life. Like, just not a lot. And he must have been educated, and he must have been learned, because he, he was a politician. He worked in public office. But... Philip married Ellen Swan. She was the daughter of a Baltimore attorney, and they were married November 18th, 1845. But 10 years later, Ellen died. And, you know, I couldn't find out how. But by then, they'd had four children. So she died, you know, 10 years into their marriage and left her children motherless. By 1859, you know, so just a few years after their marriage, Philip was reportedly the most handsome man in Washington, D.C., and within a few years of Ellen's death, he was known to be a flirtatious widower. Um, Philip went on to serve as the United States Attorney for the District of Columbia. So when I say he had education, he obviously went to university, or, and he, he must have gone to law school if he's a state's attorney. I just couldn't really find a lot of information on that because his death was so infamous. Um, anyway, um, when Daniel and Teresa were married, Daniel was serving as, or he, he was practicing as an attorney and a New York assemblyman, and he was by all accounts a rising star. He was part of the Tammany, Tammany Hall Democratic Political Machine. And even after his marriage, his reputation as a ladies' man did not end. In fact, he continued to have um, extramarital affairs, including a long-term relationship with Fanny White, the owner of a brothel, a well-known brothel in New York. But he claimed to love his young, beautiful wife, publicly claimed to love her. If Teresa was aware of his affairs, she chose to endure them in silence. There's no record of her ever mentioning them. So in 1856, Daniel was elected to the U.S. Congress and he moved his wife and their daughter to Washington, D.C. Yeah, you see where it's starting to come together here? The Sickles were very popular in Washington social circles and they entertained in their impressive home near Lafayette Square, not far from the White House or the President's House, as it was called then. Teresa was beautiful, she was charming, she was well-educated, and she was a perfect Washington hostess. She easily won the admiration of men and women alike. Daniel was not a leader in Congress at this point, but it was thought by most people that one day this politician from New York, this undisputed up-and-comer, could one day move down the block to occupy that house located at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, a.k.a. the White House. 
But when the sickles were not entertaining, Daniel's work and, air quotes, other interests kept him away, and Teresa was alone a lot. Now, the sickles met Philip in March 1857 at one of these social affairs. The two men played an all-night whist game. Whist is a card game. I didn't know I had to look it up. And after that game, Philip, you know, he, he started to become friendly with the couple and he became interested in Teresa. And this is after a couple years after his wife's death. And with um, Daniel frequently absent, Philip just began to visit Teresa regularly. And eventually they were inseparable. They attended balls and parties and receptions and plays. And, you know, according to public opinion, it was natural. It was only a matter of time before they became lovers. Now, in spite of any precautions, the couple tried to take, and I'm not sure that they actually tried to take any, but um, the affair became public knowledge. It was common knowledge in Washington, D.C. social circles. And it was obvious to everybody in their social circles that they were having an affair. They were lovers. They were seen together. It was apparent that they had secrets and that they had shared commonalities, that they, they reportedly were casually play, playful and even affectionate in public. And they really didn't seem to worry too much publicly about the consequences. It later became clear that they met in an unoccupied home not far from Teresa's and Daniel's home. And Daniel seemed to be the only one in the city unaware of his wife's romance with Philip. However, that changed when Daniel received an anonymous letter detailing Teresa's affair with Philip. The letter stated in part, quote, Dear Sir, with a deep regret, I enclose to your address a few lines, but an indispensable duty compels me to do so, seeing that you are greatly imposed upon. There is a fellow, I may say, for he is not a gentleman by any means of the, of the name of Philip. Or, oh, Philip Barton Key, and I believe the district attorney who rents a house situated on 15th Street between K and L Streets for no other purpose than to meet your wife, Mrs. Sickles. He hangs a string out of the window as a signal to her that he is in and leaves the door unfastened, and she walks in, and, sir, I do assure you with these few hints. I leave the rest for you to imagine, most respectfully, your friend, RPG. Daniel did not know who RPG was, and in all my reading, I did not find anything that identified who he was, so it's a mystery. But the note was persuasive. I am sure that he wanted to, Daniel wanted to ignore the allegation. Um, I'm sure a hundred thoughts went through his head. Is this political intrigue by my social, my, my political opponents? Is this just gossip? But it was specific, and it was troublingly specific. Um, the letter writer referred to a house with a specific address, like he gave the specific address in the letter. He knew details about how they arranged their comings and goings, and Daniel decided he could not or should not ignore the note. He had to find out whether or not his wife had betrayed him with another man, and it would be a simple matter just to investigate. So later that Friday... Um, the letter came on, I don't remember what day the letter came on, but on Friday, Daniel asked his friend George to find the house and to talk to the people who lived next to it and on the street and to see what they knew. Now, it turned out that the people who lived near that house on 15th Street saw a lot and they were willing to talk. They did, in fact, confirm to George that a man and woman matching Philip and Teresa's descriptions had been seen entering the house on more than one occasion. Um, in their mind, this could only mean one thing, um, and it was common knowledge among the local inhabitants that something unseemingly was occurring there. You know, in that day, women did not go uh, into a man's company alone, except for their husband. 
So George reported back to Daniel that same Friday, but there was some conflicting information. Um, the neighbors had given George the day of the prior Thursday as being the most recent rendezvous between the couple. However, um, Teresa could be accounted for the entire day of Thursday. She could not have met Philip on Thursday. So then again, um, Daniel is thinking that maybe this is just um, a misunderstanding or a political, you know, something or other. So he sent George back out on Saturday. George went and talked to the witnesses again. And after conversing with George and each other, the neighbors agreed that that actual last meeting had happened on Wednesday, not Thursday. So Daniel was now devastated. And I keep going back to the fact that he had his own mistresses, including a brothel owner. However, he was devastated. He said he was devastated. He had hoped that the woman that had met with Philip on Thursday, that way it couldn't be his wife. But this newest information um, only led to one conclusion. Teresa was having an affair with Philip. Daniel was in shock. To be cuckold by his wife was unforgivable. It was an affront to a man of his standing. Um, we won't even go into that because oh, double standards much. But anyway. And he continued to say or to claim that he really just genuinely loved Teresa. So he was just wounded to the core that his wife would be having an affair. You know, he has them, but you know, she can't, you know, eh, sorry. We're going to go away from that again. Um, so that Sunday evening, he um, confronted his wife. Teresa was caught by surprise and she denied the affair, but it was one of those me thinketh so protesteth too loudly scenarios because while she was animate in her um, denial, there wasn't a lot of conviction there and Daniel had too many details. Um, he knew the address. He knew when the last time they met and Teresa realized that she could not um, deny it any longer. She broke down and said, quote, I am betrayed and lost. She then confessed more to her husband. She said that she was engaged in, quote, intimacy of an improper kind, end quote, with Philip. Um, and then she said, quote, I did what is, un what is usual for a wicked woman to do, end quote. Um, Philip knows nada about what's going on inside the Sickles household. He does have any idea. But he wants to see Teresa again, and she had stopped returning his, had stopped contacting him. So what does Philip do? Well, across the way from the Sickle Home on Lafayette Park is a Cosmo Club. Philip takes a room at this club. And using his opera glasses, he starts spying on the home across the way, looking for a signal that Teresa wanted to meet. However, he was an impatient man. And on Sunday, February 27th, 1859, Philip could wait no longer. So that morning, he walked out of the club. And I'm thinking this is about a week later, about a week. He paced back in front of the Sickles house, waving a handkerchief, trying to signal to Teresa that he wanted to arrange a rendezvous. Teresa, however, um, was inside the home and she was completely despondent. She was reportedly on the floor, writhing in agony that her secret had been discovered. And her attendant, a woman named Bridget, could not even console her. She, Teresa just was not responding to any um, attempt to console her. In another part of the house, Daniel was talking with a political supporter, a man named Samuel Butterworth. Samuel was a Tammany Hall operative. He was there in um, from New York visiting another senator, and Daniel summoned him to come to his home to talk about what options were available to deal with Philip. So Samuel came to Daniel's house at once. It's an emergency, right? And he found Daniel prostrate on a bed with a pillow over his head. Daniel was reportedly hysterical. 
And he told his friend Samuel all of his thoughts and his feelings. He also showed Samuel a confession that Teresa had written at his um, direction. Um, Samuel was stunned. He offered some advice, but it didn't do much to calm Daniel down. Um, Samuel excused himself and marched over to a bar to get a drink. I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm sure there's booze in the house. I don't know what that was all about. Anyway, um, Samuel came back, and when he got back to the sickle home, George was in the library of the home. So Samuel and George began to discuss this whole sordid situation, and then Daniel came into the room. Now, Daniel had apparently seen Philip walking up and down the street, waving his hanky, trying to get Teresa's attention. And he told the men what he had seen, and he referred to Philip as a villain. And George commented that he had also seen Philip outside, and Samuel began to believe that Daniel could become violent. Samuel tried to soothe Daniel by suggesting that maybe there was a possibility of keeping this information from becoming public. Um, there's no reason to have this destroy your political career or your reputation. Are you sure that the whole city knows that? No, it's, and Daniel told him, yes, that the whole city, the whole town was already aware of the affair. And when Samuel realized that the affair could not be hid from public scrutiny, he changed his tune. And he said, quote, if that be so, there is but one course left for you. And as a man of honor, you need no advice, end quote. Um, does that sound like to you that he just said, go challenge him to a duel? You know, go, go kill him, go do something. Oh, <sighs> anyway. Samuel offered to go outside and determine whether or not Philip was indeed renting rooms across the way at the club. Now, Philip is completely oblivious to the drama going, in, going on inside the Sickles home, and he's still walking up and down the street trying to get a, a signal to Teresa. Well, as he's walking up and down the street, he sees Samuel approaching him. And um, Philip and Samuel are not strangers. They knew each other. So they stood on the corner of Lafayette Square and chatted. Sam asked if Philip had come from the club. Philip said yes, he, he had just been there. Um, Samuel then asked about a friend of Philip's who had been ill, and Philip acknowledged the man was still ill. And then Samuel turned around to walk away, and when he did, Daniel was headed right toward them. Now Philip, oblivious Philip, sticks out his hand and offers to shake Daniel's hand, who then yelled back at him that he was a scoundrel that had dishonored the sickle house and must die. Philip's response, for what? So without another word, Daniel sticks his hand into his pocket, pulls out a pistol and fires. The shot went wide. Philip realized he was in danger, so he stuck his own hand into his own pocket and pulled out his opera glasses. And then he advanced toward Daniel and grabbed his coat. Philip swung the glasses to hit Daniel to try and prevent him from firing again. Daniel was able to back away and pull himself free, and he fired again, and Philip threw the opera glasses. Daniel was not injured by the opera glasses, but Philip had been shot. He staggered away, begging Daniel not to shoot him again. Daniel would not be dissuaded. He lugged at his wife's lover, and Philip cried out, murderer, don't murder me, murderer, after which Daniel fired at close range, hitting Philip once more. Philip collapsed, pleading, don't kill me. If ever there was a time to not bring a knife to a gunfight, this would have been it. It wasn't even a knife. It was glasses. Oh, poor oblivious Philip. By this time, Philip was on the ground in fetal position, I would think. But there was one source that said he covered his groin area as he fell to the ground. You know, I did not, could not tell if that meant he had been shot there 
or if he was protecting there. A little bit weird, but okay. And um, Daniel continued to repeat his threat that Philip needed to die for dishonoring his home. And then he fired another shot toward Philip and struck him. Daniel stood over Philip, fired another shot toward his head, but nothing happened. The weapon misfired or ran out of ammunition. Ammunition, that was weird. And the whole time Philip is yelling that he has been murdered. Well, by now the street is filled with bystanders and Daniel has chilled for a little bit and he feels he's felt the need to attempt to justify his behavior and he began to tell anybody who would listen that Philip had violated his bed. His righteous anger seemed to have left him. The crowd lifted and carried Philip toward the doctor and Daniel asked if the scoundrel was dead yet. Nobody answered him, but the crowd agreed that if Philip wasn't dead yet, he soon would be. With the dead or dying man being carried away, Daniel and Samuel, had, who had stepped out from his hiding place, you know, because Samuel's hiding. He's like, hey, go challenge this guy to a duel, but I'm going to hide behind this tree. Anyway, Daniel and Samuel had to think about what steps to take next. Um, Daniel had, in front of witnesses, shot a man dead in the street in broad daylight. So the two men hopped into a carriage and headed over to the home of the United States Attorney General, a man named Jeremiah Black. Daniel stayed at the Attorney General's home until the police came to escort him to the police station. On the way there, he received permission to stop at his home, where he told Teresa what he had done, and then headed toward the Washington, D.C. jail. Faced with a plethora of criminal charges, Daniel assembled a crackerjack legal team to defend him. A prominent criminal lawyer from New York, James Brady, took the lead. And aside from Brady being, you know, a, a prominent lawyer, he and Daniel were also longtime friends. Um, Edwin Stanton was a lawyer known for being a little bit melodramatic in his appeal to the jury's emotions. He was also hired on to defend what seemed to be an indefensible crime. And eventually, Daniel would have eight lawyers join his team. Robert Old was the lead prosecutor. He had actually been Philip's principal assistant when he served as a um, district attorney for the D.C. and was no stranger to the courtroom. He had a mind for detail and was well known for his very thorough preparation. But despite his familiarity with trials, he was often considered a soft-spoken or meek man and fearful that that would um, not be enough to withstand the flamboyant defense that Daniel had hired. Philip's relatives actually paid for James Carlyle to join the prosecution. Now, Daniel had, in fact, shot a man in cold blood in full view of witnesses. He made no effort to conceal his crime or his identity. And in most scenarios like this, the only question would be whether or not the act was murder or a lesser homicide crime, like manslaughter. But Robert and James, um, they understood this, ta this daunting task that laid ahead of them. So jury selection begins April 4th, 1859, and 75 men were initially called, and of those 75, 72 sympathized with the defendant. 200 potential jurors had to be excused before a group of 12 could be impaneled. 212 people, and 200 of them felt sorry for the murderer not the murdered. In his opening statement, Robert insisted that Daniel should be convicted of murder. His actions on February 27th showed a calculating murderer who had planned the crime for several days. He should not be acquitted, Robert told the jury, quote, no matter what may be the antecedent provocation in the case. Robert got to the heart of the matter quickly, the outcome depended on whether or not the jury believed that the antecedent provocation, 
the sexual affair between Philip and Teresa justified Daniel's homicide. John Graham delivered the opening statement for the defense, and as expected, he painted a picture of a loving family man, a devoted husband and father, who confronted a, quote, confirmed and habitual, end quote, adulterer. John cited the Bible. He claimed that Daniel did what any self-respecting man would do, and that his act was the fulfillment of, quote, the will of heaven, end quote. Um, John, though, recognized that the jurors probably were not going to be impressed with his idea of this divine intervention idea, so he offered another possible explanation for Daniel's behavior. The poor man was out of his mind when he shot Philip Barton Key. John stated, quote, he was in a state of white heat that was too great a state of passion for a man to be in who saw before him the hardened, unrelenting seducer of his wife. John's opening statement lasted for three days. He continued to assassinate Philip's character and brought up continually the seduction of Teresa and that it was their behavior, not Daniel's actions, that the trial should focus on. Um, it was a perfect criminal defense attorney strategy. Put the victim on trial, not the defendant. And Daniel had the ability to appear sympathetic. He was a wronged husband, a father. He desired nothing more than justice for his broken family. Now, the prosecution had two ways they could go about this. They could attack Daniel's credibility they could bring into play the fact that he had multiple mistresses, that he was in a long-time relationship with the owner of a brothel. You know, they, they could go there or they could argue the facts of the case. Um, Robert presented many witnesses to attest to the shooting um, and all of them, or rather none of them, stated that Daniel looked to be insane. And Robert chose to try the case on Daniel's behavior, not his um, character, and it was a costly mistake. The defense had witnesses to testify that Daniel was desperate, that he was full of anguish, that he loved his young wife. And um, Robert repeatedly tried to exclude evidence of the affair in fact, the judge tried to or told the jury that it was not evidence, but witnesses mentioned it more than one time. And Teresa's written confession, which was excluded from evidence, was printed in a prominent magazine, which I'm sure influenced the jurors, right? Um, Edwin Stanton delivered the defense, summata defense summation, and he just pontificated on the sanctity of the American family, which I believe in, and the rights of the aggrieved husband. I don't agree with him on this. He spoke of a woman who surrendered to an adulterer. He described Daniel as a man driven temporarily insane when he shot his wife's paramour. This temporary insanity argument was the winning formula for the defense. The jury deliberated for a little longer than an hour before returning a not guilty verdict. And the acquittal surprised nobody. And it was clear through the trial that the defense had convincingly portrayed Daniel as a despondent husband and father who went temporarily insane. In fact, courtroom spectators cheered when he was acquitted. And his Daniel himself, he threw a party for 1,500 of his closest friends and family, she says, dripping in sarcasm. Daniel escaped formal justice, but he did pay a price for this murder. His once promising political career was no longer limitless. Before the shooting, he had been a slightly scandalous figure, but people were um, willing to overlook that because of his wit and his charm. Um, after the trial, he remained a congressman, but he withdrew from public life. And then public opinion turned against him when he reconciled with Teresa just a few months after his acquittal. 
the public's thought process was, if he was so despondent that he went insane, why would he take his wife back? So this once lovable rogue um, was now somebody that people um, avoided. So while his the trajectory of his career um, changed, the history had not heard the last of Daniel. He would make his mark again, but it was always with scandal. During the Civil War, he was commissioned as a major in the Union Army, and he even lost a leg at the Battle of Gettysburg. But he um, disobeyed orders. So, you know, he's, he's a war hero. He's a wounded war hero, but he disobeyed orders. He was actually awarded the Medal of Honor for gallantry, but it took 34 years before he was awarded that honor. And he retired with the rank of um, Major General. Um, in the 1870s, um, Daniel was serving as the United States Minister to Spain, and he kind of put a new twist on the term foreign affairs by seducing the deposed Queen Isabella II. <laughs> he never escaped the fall of those actions, and um, even though he returned to the United States, he still persever persevered in his career. He was even re-elected to the House of Representatives in the 1890s, but his nickname um, was now Devil Dan, and he really could not overcome that um, reputation as a scoundrel. He lived until 1914 and died at the ripe old age of 94 without really appearing to be um, repentant or sorry for his behavior. Teresa, on the other hand, was not as fortunate. She emerged from the scandal as a fallen woman in an era of double standards. Her actions were much less forgivable than her husband's violent reaction. Um, so even though she and Daniel reconciled, it was reported that behind closed doors they were estranged. So they didn't divorce or anything, but they were no longer a happily married couple. But no longer young, no longer really attractive and desirable young woman that she had been, um, Teresa suffered through her unhappy marriage. And she died of tuberculosis in 1867 at the old, old age of 31. Poor Teresa, man. Not only did she get swept off her feet by this older man at the age of 15, she was Convinced she was in love, she married a man who probably she shouldn't have, somebody who had already learned how to use his looks and his charm to get what he wanted out of life. Um, she did not have the kind of life that she was raised to expect, I'm sure. But then this whole society double standard where women have to, had to be perfect and genteel and men could go, you know, crawling around and doing whatever they want with whoever they wanted without any consequence really came back to haunt her. And then on top of that, she gets tuberculosis. I mean, that is not a painless illness, especially in that day and time. I just, I just feel bad for her. I feel bad for her all the way around. Now there is something to be said about consequences of her own choices. And she really should not have, engaged in an extramarital affair. I will be the morality police on that one. She, she should not have gone there, but man, I feel bad for her. Uh, anyway, I like how the card turned out. Um, I don't love the hair combination. It was a new one for me, but I like how the card turned out in general. And this is Teresa. This is a picture of Teresa that I found. And I have a picture of her husband, Daniel. Yeah, I can see how he was considered handsome. Don't dig the mustache, but I can see how he was considered handsome. And here's a picture of Philip. So yeah, leave me a comment down below. Tell me how you feel about how this story turned out. I have a couple other videos here for you. I think you will enjoy. I've also added a subscribe button. Well, I'm so glad you hung out with me today. I know it's a bit of a long one and a weird one. Give me a thumbs up. Let YouTube know you like the story. Leave me a comment down below and have a really fabulous day.